Hello. Oh, okay. Okay. That's better. Um, right. So, very broadly speaking, talk is divided into three sections. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about physics motivations to keep it self-contained. Um, and I'll talk about how Calavi Yau is featured in string theory and why are CCs or the complete intersection Calavi Yau manifolds important. And, and there will be machine learning interludes uh, in between. So uh, these are the collaborators that uh, collaborators and consultants uh, um, that uh, I work with. Kyron Bull uh, is a student. Uh, uh, in fact, most of the work done here uh, was done as part of his master's thesis, and he's responsible for implementing all of this. So he, he, and uh, he has recently moved to Leeds from Oxford for his PhD. Uh, Vishnu Jajala, Yang Hui He are familiar. Yain Gael uh, is uh, a new computer science professor in Oxford, and he's interested in applying machine learning to various uh, different fields. And there's also DJ Krishnamurti from DeepMind, uh, who is interested in more formal aspects of uh, machine learning. And uh, the work I'm presenting here was done using the Hydra computer cluster. Right. This is the single greatest contribution of machine learning in, in our line of business. A few years ago, before the uh, Higgs was announced, I got an email which was, uh, which was marked as spam because the subject line read, the Higgs boson does not exist. So indirectly detecting the Higgs boson before the LHC. It was quite impressive. Right. Um, String theory is the only known consistent theory of quantum gravity. Waiting for rebuttals. Uh, no loop quantum gravity people here. That's great. Um, it postulates ex Your talk will be online. Sorry? Your talk will be online. I see. Mm, okay. So some video editing might be required. <laughs> I see. Um, so the two main, uh, main features of uh, string theory is that it postulates extra dimensions of space and it relies on a fundamental uh, symmetry called supersymmetry that we all know and love. Also importantly, string theory is an organizing principle for mathematics. Uh, it ties together various branches of mathematics um, and uh, it's, it's the common playground. Right. Now, in most approaches to string model building, um, String theory, the gauge group of string theory is broken to the gauge group of a grand unified theory. There are some phenomenological reasons for wanting to do this, which in turn is then broken to the standard model gauge group. And this whole business is called string compactification, where the low energy theory is recovered by hiding away the extra dimensions. And this process uh, places severe constraints on the extra dimensions uh, or the extra dimensional space. So what is the holy grail? Uh, we, we were talking about uh, uh, this in the discussion session. Uh, we touched upon this. So the holy grail for a string phenomenologist would be to reproduce the particle content, coupling constants, masses of particles. Wouldn't it be great if one could find the mass of the electron from one of these models? Um, explain the origin of discrete symmetries of standard model uh, that help explain things that do not happen. Um, explain or often invoked to explain the long lifetime of the proton, <coughs> etc. There are other uh, more um, fiddly challenges. Uh, uh, that is to explain fine tuning, modelized stabilization, supersymmetry breaking, and so on. So I am interested in a very particular uh, sector of string theory called uh, Calavio compactifications of the heterotic string. And until around 2010, I think there were around four string derived standard models with with semi-realistic uh, spectrum. But since then, there have been tens of thousands. So we have a lot of data now. And this is primarily due to some innovative mathematical constructions. You uh, heard from the previous talk that there are these line bundle constructions on Calabi House. And this also has to do with increased computational prowess. Right. I highlighted discrete symmetries in the previous uh, slide because it is one of my interests. Uh, and uh, in, the, in, in superstring theory, discrete symmetries that you invoke or that you want to have in your four-dimensional theory must be found as isometries of the compactification space. 
And there are a couple of uh, important uh, discrete symmetry groups that are not um, that are not really necessary, but are often invoked to explain certain uh, things. So, for example, to explain the structure of the mismatch of quantum states uh, uh, in flavor changing processes, one often invokes uh, uh, this group delta 27, or uh, I think it was in Patrick's talk uh, where he spoke about delta 54. Uh, in the same, same category of groups. Uh, uh, I use the word category loosely here. Yeah. Um, there's also R symmetry, which is often invoked uh, to explain why the proton is stable in a minimally supersymmetric version of the standard model. And uh, Alon touched upon this, uh, I believe, in his talk a couple of days ago. And again, the origin of such uh, hypothesized symmetries in the 4D theory is not really understood. Uh, so it would be nice if one could find these symmetries as isometries of the compactification space. And not a lot of work has been done towards this classification. There is another advantage to computing discrete symmetries of compactification spaces, which is that most known Calabi-Yaws are simply connected but most quasi-realistic string models are built over quotient manifolds because you, you really need a um, non-simply connected manifold to break the gut gauge group to the standard model gauge group. So flux lines around the irreducible parts of the manifold allow this breaking to happen. Right. So, Quick overview of Calabio compactifications of the heterotic string. It, it is one of the most promising approaches uh, for string model building. And uh, the starting point is that the space time is realized um, as being factorized as um, a four dimensional space time times a six dimensional space, where if you assume that the four dimensional space is maximally symmetric, and you assume that uh, the internal space is Riemannian, we, we need a theory of gravity, so it has to be Riemannian. If you further demand that uh, you want an irreducible manifold, reducible uh, compactification spaces are difficult to reconcile chiral fermions uh, with, so we, we want irreducible ones. And in addition, if you demand n equals to ones supersymmetry in the 4D theory, then owing to a classification of manifolds by, due to Berger in the 60s, uh, the holonomy of X6 is, uh, or the internal space, is then determined to be SU3. But there's no guarantee that such manifolds actually exist. And the Calabi conjecture proved by you, uh, sorry, Yao, uh, <laughs> this definitely has to be edited, sorry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> proved by Yao, uh, showed existence uh, of such uh, manifolds. So we, we come to the conclusion that XX is a Calabi-Yau threefold, right. I think I can skip over this. Everyone knows what a Calabi-Yau manifold is. Um, so, right. But what is the model like, what is the modelized space of Calabi-Yau threefolds? So there are only two unspecified Hodge numbers for a Calabi-Yau threefold, H11 and H21. So these are related to the dimensions of the Kähler structure moduli and the complex structure moduli, respectively. And there's also uh, the important phenomenon of mirror symmetry, where if you swap the Kähler structure and the complex structure moduli spaces, you get a mirror manifold. Uh, <coughs> this is what is known as the Hodge diamond. And the Hodge diamond for a Calabi or threefold with SU3 holonomy exactly and not holonomy contained in SU3 looks like this. And as, as you can see, there are only two unspecified Hodge numbers, H11 and H21. And the reason I'm mentioning them is because I'm, we're interested, uh, like um, uh, um, some others here, in learning these uh, Hodge numbers, machine learning these Hodge numbers. Right. So some of you have, uh, well, probably all of you have seen this plot. Uh, in the x-axis is uh, the Euler characteristic, which is twice the difference of these two Hodge numbers. And in the y-axis is the sum of these two Hodge numbers. This is a very beautiful plot. Uh, it's called the Hodge plot. And it has roughly half a billion uh, data points. Um, and if you see at the bottom, uh, it's uh, 
you, you can't really see anything, but there's, there has been a lot of activity in the past few years, or past several years, filling up uh, or populating this, this portion. So if you zoom in, uh, you see a bunch of manifolds here. The color coding have to do with, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with the timeline of when these manifolds were, uh, or when these uh, points were populated. And we have a catalog of uh, all uh, Calabio manifolds that we know uh, up, up until height 24. So very, very, very uh, large, uh, it's, it's uh, being populated. And the interesting thing is, uh, there are a lot of uh, examples uh, where, the, where there are manifolds that uh, are neither complete intersection Calabria manifolds nor appear in the Kruger-Skarka list. Uh, again, sorry? No, they are, they are, there are some examples which, which are completely different. In fact, uh, this is the one uh, manifold, uh, its Hodge numbers are 1, 1. And this is, uh, so if you demand a Kähler uh, Calabio manifold, and, which is not rigid, then this is the lowest Hodge number you can possibly get. This is Volker Braun's uh, manifold where he took the 24 cell and he quotiented it out by three different discrete symmetry groups. And he found a Calabria threefold. What did you start with? A 24 cell. 24 cell. I, I, can, I can show you the reference. Uh, but this is not in Kroger's Cartridge? No, no. This is not in, definitely not in Kroger's Cartridge. Yeah. And uh, against uh, Philip Candelas's wishes, I have uh, put <laughs> all these rigid manifolds. He doesn't like it because it, uh, it uh, violates the symmetry of this graph. But, uh, but this is the truth. Okay, so how, how does one, uh, so I'm, I'm getting towards constructing a class of uh, Calabria manifolds called complete intersection manifolds. Uh, so if you want to construct it as submanifolds of CM, you, you can't really do it because a connected compact analytic submanifold of CM is a point. So you ought to be looking at, well, you, you, it, it's not true that you ought to be looking at, but the, one of the other things you could look at is uh, a complex projective space. Um, uh, uh, because all its closed uh, complex submanifolds are also compact. And the theorem states that all such submanifolds can be realized as a zero locus of a finite number of homogeneous polynomials. And all of us have probably seen examples of uh, this nature. The Fermat Quintic is, the, is probably the most famous example where you take coordinates uh, in CP4 and you, you, you take a deg this degree five polynomial and the zero locus defines the manifold. Generalizing from the quintic, one arrives at the class of complete intersection Calabria manifolds, where your ambient space is a product of complex projective spaces, and you come up with a set of k polynomials, which, uh, which are representative of these k columns here, and these guys, Q1, uh, Qijs, are the multi-degrees of the polynomials in the various uh, uh, projective spaces. Uh, right. For this to represent a Calabria manifold, so you, you can't just write any matrix of uh, integers like this and expect a Calabria manifold, but if you impose a couple of conditions, you'll be guaranteed to end up with uh, a Calabria threefold or a fourfold. And uh, so, so this condition, which says that uh, N1 plus one will be the sum of uh, the first uh, row, is essentially saying that the first term class is zero. And if you want a threefold, then you want uh, the number of polynomials and the number of uh, projective factors to have a relationship. Uh, not sure if I've written that correctly, but that's, that's not really very important, so I'll, I'll, I'll ignore that. Um, in total, there are roughly 8,000 CC matrices in the list, and uh, although this list has been around for a while, uh, we know that only, uh, well, at least 2,590 are known to be distinct as classical manifolds. So actually, it's not really known if, uh, if the rest, uh, there are equivalences. 
and there are only 266 distinct Hodge pairs. And uh, the H11s uh, range between 0 and 19, and the H21s range between 0 and 101. So if I, had, if I were given a choice to learn, to machine learn one of these uh, uh, Hodge numbers, I would probably go with the one which doesn't have uh, so much range. So I'd probably go with H11. The Euler characteristic uh, are all negative uh, for these manifolds, and the uh, and the largest value is minus, uh, well, the smallest value is minus 200, right? And if you compare this with the uh, number of uh, uh, CC fourfold configurations, there are a lot more, and uh, there are four. Sorry, the, uh, there are four Hodge numbers, uh, but they are uh, independent Hodge numbers, but they are related by this relationship. This is just for reference. We'll not be talking about Calabria fourfolds, right? Well, here are some nice pictures. Uh, so, so the matrices and the pictures or the graphs are equivalent. Uh, the yes. So the so the blue uh, things represent the polynomials, and the red annuli represent uh, the spaces. And they are, the, the degree of connection is given by the number of uh, is given by the multi degree. And they are completely equivalent. And in fact, uh, this is a bipartite graph representation of this matrix. And uh, I, I put this here because I think there are applications uh, um, of, of this, uh, this representation in understanding features of CCs using graph neural networks. No one has tried it, but it would be interesting to try. And the other, uh, the other reason for uh, this, this, these two particular choices of manifolds is to demonstrate that sometimes the entire Sagan cohomology of the uh, Calabi-Yau descends from that of the ambient space, which is demonstrated by the fact that there are five P1 factors here, and the H11 of this manifold, which is the first entry here, is five. And sometimes it is not. Uh, sometimes, uh, you know, naively one would expect that the H11 of this manifold is two, which is in fact 12, because uh, this is actually a CC which is realized uh, as a hypersurface in a product of two del pezzos of degree four. And uh, so DP4 is P2 blown up in five points, so each DP4 factor gives you six, explaining why the H11 of this manifold is 12. Okay, right. So favorability of CCs is one of the machine learning, pro one of the properties of CCs that we would like to machine learn. And uh, I've ex already explained what uh, favorability is, but they are really important because uh, it, it helps tremendously when you are constructing uh, line bundle sum models, for example, or monad bundles, to have a favorable CC, to have the second cohomology descend from the ambient space. And, um, the fraction of CCs uh, uh, that are favorable uh, is well, it's 62 percent, uh, so it's a more or less balanced data set. Um, I think in um, early this year or probably last year, uh, Lara Anderson, James Gray were able to show that all these uh, CCs can actually be uh, brought into a favorable uh, configuration, sort of like uh, the same manifold, but represented not by this small matrix, but a larger matrix, where you have made it favorable. And they could show that this can be done for all but 48 CC configuration matrices. The rest can be thought of as being favorably embedded in a product of del pezzo surfaces, which is a nice result. So there are two CC lists, lists floating around. One is the old one, and one is the new one. The new one has more favorable CCs. We'll stick with the new one because the old one requires a bunch of uh, classification projects uh, to really start playing with. Uh, right. So the quest first question we ask is, can favorability of CCs be learned by machine learning tools? And the two tools we use are neural networks and support vector machines. Enough has been said about neural networks here, so I'll, I'll skip over this. Uh, instead, I will uh, point out that in our implementation, we have uh, invoked uh, some convolution neural networks, which is very important in the field of computer vision. And um, there is a visual representation of a CC, which I've borrowed uh, 
from Yang's first paper on, on these things. And um, this is uh, a configuration, CC configuration matrix, it, it's some random CC configuration matrix, and this is an average one. But truth be told, we have not actually used uh, this visual representation in, uh, in our, um, as our inputs. Uh, this is just for um, aesthetics, uh, for, for this talk. Uh, yeah. Right. I, I will talk a little bit about support vector machines uh, because no one has spoken about it. This is a more geometric approach to machine learning. So if you imagine having two clusters of data and uh, you, are, you are expected to separate them uh, by drawing a straight line, one would imagine that the job is essentially equivalent to finding a hyperplane in this feature space from which all the data points are maximally separated. So it is an optimization problem. In fact, it is a quadratic optimization problem and there are plenty of solvers that are readily available which one can use. So uh, the issue of being stuck in a local minima uh, does not usually occur in SVMs unless, uh, unless there are special situations. Uh, but but this, is, this is only applicable to linearly separable data. If you have data that, that where the boundary should really look like a nonlinear curve, what do you do? There's this thing called kernel trick where you map all these data points to a higher dimensional space where the data is actually linearly separable. There you find your optimal hyperplane and you map it back to your original space and you have uh, this nonlinear uh, boundary, which is great. But in principle, you actually don't have to do anything. What you really need to do is look at the optimization problem that you're solving for the SVM and there are a lot of inner products uh, happening there and you replace all the inner products by these kernel functions. And that is enough to have this effect of um, solving the nonlinear version of, of this problem. Right. SVMs, support vector machines, can also uh, work as, can work as uh, classifiers as well as regressors. Uh, so uh, as a regressor, you basically try to fit the flattest line uh, to the data within some allowed residue, epsilon. In the interest of saving time, I'll, I'll only uh, talk about uh, architectures if I'm asked. Uh, so I'll, I'll gloss over it. But the, the one important point I'll make here is that uh, in our implementation, we have used neural networks and support vector machines. And a genetic algorithm was used to fix the hyperparameters of the neural network. It's just number of hidden layers, number of neurons, uh, activation functions, and dropout. Dropout is a way of uh, way to counter overfitting in uh, neural networks. Uh, um, yes, so conveniently skipping skipping over that. Okay, these are the results of the first uh, experiment that we have done uh, on machine learning uh, uh, the favorability. The top curves so are the uh, learning curves uh, for or the training accuracy curves for the neural net and the support vector machine. Uh, and, the bot uh, and the curves below here are the validation curves. The axis here, uh, x-axis, is the fraction of data used for training. So you see accuracy improving as you train with more larger and larger fraction of the data, which is all very nice. Uh, um, and the y-axis is uh, the accuracy, right? And this, uh, th this was a binary classification problem. So we input a CC matrix and we ask the question, you know, is it favorable or is it not? And it's uh, able to do this uh, you know, with a high degree of accuracy, which is nice. Right. So, so what, percentage are, what percentage of the CCs are actually favorable? 62. As you see all of this. Yes, that's what I uh, made clear uh, in one of the previous slides, that we did use the old list. In the new list, it's very, um, in the new list, it would be like oh, more than 95%. Yeah, but it would be a nice thing to try. But you trade, but you, sorry, but 60, so it's only 62% that actually are favorable. Yeah. No, it's more, but in the old. In, in, in the list that we are using, that is true. There is an updated list as of. Sorry, sorry, there's a correct answer. It's either 60% or it's not. If the old list only makes 60% clear, that's, that's 
that's not the right answer. The new list casts it in a way that makes favorability obvious, right? Yes. And it's yes. much higher, right? Yeah, it is. It is. It is uh, it's only uh, for, 48 right. of 7,890 matrices are not favorable in that sense. Exactly. So 99% of the examples are favorable. So you could just say uh, a stupid algorithm would be always yes, and that would have 99% accuracy. That is true, which is why when we do attacks, um, these kind of unbalanced problems, and there is an example of that, yeah. we have different benchmarks for that. Yeah. But uh, since we use the old list, um, because the new list only appeared uh, not so long ago, and many properties of the new list have actually not been computed, so we prefer to stick with the old list. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, so you use the labels of the old list also? Yeah, 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 of oh, course. I'm sorry, that's what I misunderstood. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fav favorability so is not a. The hmm. old list only happens in 60% of these. Yes, yes. Even though the correct answer is 99%. Wait a minute, there's no correct answer about favorability. Either the Kalabi is favorable or it's not, I don't care. No, it uh, depends on the representation. It depends ah. on the representation. Okay. It's not a topological property. Um, it, it's a it, it's a function of the representation. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. Otherwise, that, that would be cheating. Otherwise, yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. So uh, the question after this is: Can you learn further properties of uh, these uh, manifolds? And uh, we want to learn the Hodge numbers. And these are the list of references where um, people have computed uh, the Hodge numbers of CCs uh, and CC quotients. And uh, well, this is the first paper here, and uh, uh, as you saw in the previous talk, there's a lot of sequence chasing involved, and, uh, but sometimes there are nicer solutions. You do some parameter counting that will enable you to find the H21, and uh, I've worked on a couple of uh, these papers here, and uh, it's, uh, it's very nice to be able to compute Hodge numbers for these CC quotients, primarily because uh, sometimes it gives you a very nice insight into understanding the algebraic geometry. And you can be very explicit uh, in your computations. Uh, um, this, is, uh, this is one of the graphs uh, that we uh, constructed while trying to understand uh, the Hodge number of a CC quotient embedded in a product of two del pezzos. And what this graph represents are the intersection properties of the exceptional divisors in, in, that, uh, in, in those del pezzo surfaces. Um, leave it at that. So uh, what happens when we try to machine learn uh, H11? So uh, I, I was trying to motivate earlier why we choose to learn H11 and not H21. It's simply because the spread of H21 is much larger. And in addition, the Euler characteristic that, that is a function of these two guys is directly computable from the CC matrix itself. So really, only one, there's only one independent thing to be learned here. And we choose to learn um, H11, right? And here we use a uh, uh, SVM and neural net uh, regressor and a neural net classifier. And uh, these are the validation curves that, that we get, again, as a function of the fraction of data that we use for training. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry? 60% of the cases are favorable. Well, we have moved on to learning Hodge numbers now. Yes. Yes. 60% of the classes are favorable, so 60% of the classes, the answer for H11 is just the number of P1s. Yes, that is true. That would so be true. the SVM just learns this? Yes, in those cases, yes. But we do use uh, cross, uh, random cross-validation. So, yeah. But in general, you're right. So 60% cases, it, it should simply give you the number of P1 factors. Yeah. And these are the 60% percent Well, this is more than 60%. But I guess the point is, is that the non-trivial cases where, it, where it's not just going based on the number of P1, you know, that's what you're doing. Exactly, yeah. So, yeah, so, so these are the accuracies if, you, if this is the measure you, one is interested in. And the neural net uh, classifier is doing a very good job. It is winning, hands down. Um, and the support vector machine uh, isn't doing as well as you saw in the validation curves. Okay. Right. But my question was, have, yes. you at, have you looked at what the support vector machine does? Does it just give you the number of curves always? More or less. Oh, okay. Um, 
Yeah, that, that's a good thing to see. Uh, we, we, we haven't, I haven't unpacked it yet. I, I, I'll find out. But I guess because it's 70 rather than 60, that, can, that could be part of the answer, but it would be a partial answer. That's true, yeah. If it, was le if it were less than 60, that would be embarrassing. <laughs> yeah. If it were exactly 60. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's up so high above 60, so the question is, does more or less yeah, yeah. More, more or less. I, I'll try to meet the high standards in future experiments. <laughs> so I'll just... Uh, uh, keep moving. So this is this is a nice way of actually uh, looking at um, this is a histogram uh, plot of all the Hodge numbers. So from uh, you know you go up till 19 here, and uh, the Hodge numbers peak at seven, I think. Yeah. Uh, so th these are all the uh, Hodge numbers for all the CCs, and the 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 green one is the true distribution, and the yellow one is what uh, our machine learning algorithms are predicting. It looks uh, pretty nice. Uh, uh, on the, uh, here we train with 20% of the data, and here we train with 80% of the data, and you, you see some improvement, right? And this guy looks nice. Right. So this is probably the most important slide of my talk. Um, so the methodology that we have used so far does not really address the fundamental technical issue, and um, which is that the difficulty of the calculation increases with the number of dimension and the complexity of the manifold. If you have a manifold with a very high H21, you're dealing with a much uh, uh, more difficult beast. And uh, this is one of the reasons why most explicit uh, string-derived standard model computations are on manifolds with Hodge numbers of order one. Even triangulating polytopes to populate the toric Calabria database I had to stop at H11 equals to six. So it would be in our own interest to develop techniques where the training and the data sets are different in character. And one of the nice things to be able to do would be to train with the easy cases and predict the harder ones for which a paper calculation might be much more intricate, and the answers might actually be unknown. So in that spirit, I'll show you some preliminary results from the paper uh, that we are um, close to finishing. Um, so we organized the CC data set into a low, training, low H11 training set and a high H11 validation set. So we'll train with uh, data where H11 is less than some particular Hodge number, say one, two, three, and so on, and then we'll, oh, man, okay. okay. Uh, and we try to uh, <clears throat> predict the high Hodge numbers. So in essence, we are creating, so we're trying to extrapolate, uh, ambitious, but we are also working with a very imbalanced data set. So in essence, you're trying to train a neural network or a support vector machine with a bunch of things, uh, let's say uh, you have trained it with manifolds up to H11 equals to two or three, and you're expecting it to predict uh, much larger numbers. So until you know, H11 equals to 19. And uh, these are some of the plots uh, from the paper. So this is the SVM predicting H11 for the CC3 folds. Here, uh, if you look at the, well, it looks purple here. I can't tell the color. But this guy is the true distribution. And the blue curve is the curve where we have only fed the neural network, not randomized data from uh, the CC list, but only with data uh, for, for manifolds with H11 less than or equal to 3. And here, it predicts uh, the nature of the distribution correctly. It, it, uh, it predicts a peak, albeit at the wrong place. And you would normally expect that as you move up, uh, as you keep on feeding the uh, machine learning tools, more and more data with high Xs, it should approach the, it should approach the um, true distribution. But the problem is, when you're doing that, because our training set and our validation sets are complementary, when you go to higher H11s, you are essentially creating, an, creating another imbalanced data set. So, so errors are expected to dip and then grow. 
which is exactly what we find, the, the neural network actually doesn't do as, as well. So in fact, when you train it with uh, H11 less than or equal to three, it mostly predicts anything new you throw it at, uh, throw at uh, the neural network, it basically predicts that it has Hodge numbers less than three. So it, it doesn't do as well. So, so these are the error, uh, uh, errors uh, that uh, one can look at. So, so, the, so, the, um, so the green ones are the validation set. Uh, I think it's the size of the validation set. And the uh, probably brown, I can't really tell, or gray in my computer. Uh, uh, gray ones are the training sets. So initially, you start by training with a very small number of uh, entities. And then you start and train with everything. And because the validation set is complementary, it decreases in size. Okay. So this is uh, what I was mentioning, that the error dips. And then uh, as you train with more and more uh, kinds of data, but eventually the error grows because you have created a very imbalanced problem. And this is the uh, root mean square error for the neural network. The support vector machine, as you saw, is actually doing much better than the neural network at this. So this is quite interesting. So th this is one of the main results of our paper. Right. So wh what is the takeaway from this analysis? That the, the main th takeaway is that these algorithms, it's showing that these algorithms are capable of predicting trends in the distribution from very limited data, which is impressive. And uh, both algorithms seem to predict a lot of values below uh, the limit uh, at which you're training it, which is natural. And the SVM performs much better than the neural net, and in fact achieves a root mean square error of one only when being trained with data H11 less than or equal to seven, whereas we can go all the way up to 19. Right. So I am almost, I'm basically out of time. So instead of struggling with it, I'll show you the highlights. Oh, actually that's not too bad. Five minutes. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'll try. So, so the third experiment uh, that uh, we have done is to machine learn discrete symmetries, and I'll show you some properties of the data set that already exists, and uh, I'll proceed like that. So the data sets that already exist are, uh, the first one is due to Braun, uh, Candelas, and Davis. Well, Braun actually uh, uh, consolidated uh, the project, and he came up with, an, uh, with a very um, uh, technical uh, group theory representation theory paper uh, where he ended up making a statement or, well, he, he performed a classification of all freely acting symmetries realized on complete intersection Calabio threefolds. And he found that only two and a half percent of all uh, CCs, so a, on, a mere 195 of them out of 7,890 actually admit discrete symmetries by a freely acting group. Andre Lucas and I looked at this 2.5% manifolds, and we actually found a uh, result which is physically very interesting because what we found is if you focused on only those handful of manifolds, around 25% of them have residual discrete symmetries that act trivially on the complex structure modelized space. So you are not really specializing in your complex structure anymore. Um, and of which 30% uh, of all the symmetries that we found were actually our symmetries. Um, we find a bunch of abelian and non-abelian groups, and these are the, this is the list of groups that we find. And as I said earlier, our symmetries are quite interesting, uh, phenomenologically speaking, at least to some phenologists. Uh, yeah. But so, so this is a very unbalanced data set. This is a more balanced data set, but the size of this data set is very small. So it's very hard to you know, uh, apply machine learning tools here, whereas here, it is an imbalanced problem, so we will try it. And Let's see what happens. Uh, so the, these, these hmm. symmetries are found by looking at the linearly realized ones on the space. Yes, that is true. That is true. If we did this now with the new list, you could find more? With the new list? Uh -huh. So with the new list, one would have to classify all the discrete symmetries uh, first. So yeah, one. So that you could redo this and you would find more? Yes, I think so. Yeah, definitely think so. So uh, the key factor in obtaining symmetries is, uh, well, they essentially descend from projective general linear groups. And the more factors you have, I, intuitively, it seems like there, there will be a lot more possibilities. Yeah. And uh, 
this was the algorithm we employed uh, in classifying those symmetries, but uh, I, I can talk about it. Uh, I love talking about it. So if someone wants to ask me this question later on, I'd be very happy. Uh, okay. So the question we asked is, given a CC configuration, can we predict if the CC admits a freely acting group? A binary classification problem, super unbalanced. And uh, like we discussed early on in the talk, uh, we need different benchmarks because if you're predicting, if the data set is so imbalanced and you're, if you're predicting one value constantly, then you'll be very accurate, but that will be, well, that, that won't be very meaningful. So, so we used uh, this confusion matrix and we used uh, F values and area under the curves. Um, so the key point is that high F value and high area under curve, good, low, bad. A typical area under the curve uh, that is better than a random guess is the blue one and uh, the diagonal one uh, is no better than random guess. And, and if you are in this region, why are you doing it at all? Okay, so we, we, uh, because it was a uh, uh, very uh, imbalanced data set, we decided to synthetically um, uh, upsample the minorities. And uh, this technique is called smorting. And smorting zero means you do nothing. Smorting 100 means you take the minority sample and you uh, make it twice. You create some new synthetic entries and you can keep going on. But uh, the bottom line is that it didn't really help us much. So the, the values here for the area under the curves and, and Fs uh, denote that uh, it, it's still a problem that we haven't properly tackled. It's, it's very difficult. Thank you. Right. So I'm actually done. Uh, the possible directions that uh, one could take uh, is that one could adapt these algorithms or other uh, machine learning algorithms uh, to similar problems in the crutches karka list. And uh, of course, this extends very naturally to CC fourfolds, which is nice. And uh, like Fabian made the point, uh, this would, uh, uh, this would uh, require creating some further data sets. Um, one could also envision constructing these line bundle sums uh, on favorable CCs, now that we have a much larger list of CCs. Um, and uh, the takeaway from this talk that uh, <clears throat> I think is important is that uh, we should explore further machine learning techniques to extrapolate even better than the res results that I was trying to show from our latest paper by training only with simple geometries and trying to find out about more complex geometries. And we should keep trying to push the boundaries of our stringy understanding of nature with, uh, with this new ally that is machine learning. So, thank you. Thank you, Challenger. Yeah, you know.